All right, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Vox Veritas Live, episode one, Practical Neuroscience. So um, thank you for joining in, those of you who are online live. Um, this is a bit of an experiment, and so thank you for joining with me in this. Um, so my name's David Carrion. I'm a psychiatrist at Stanford and do work on uh, research work on neuroscience. And I'm going to be telling you about uh, all variety of topics in neuroscience. Um, this, this course, this online uh, lecture series, um, was born out of a lot of uh, desire from you guys, um, high schoolers and middle schoolers in, uh, at Stanford, in a Stanford event called Splash. And uh, so there was a lot of people who wanted to learn about neuroscience more than I could accommodate. And so I decided to, uh, to move to the interwebs to be able to expand the uh, classroom a little bit. So um, we're going to be uh, going over a number of topics. So uh, here's, the, uh, here's the info. Um, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So what that means is if you can send me an email, shoot me a tweet, tweet, twit me a tweet. I don't know how you actually use that as a verb, but if you can communicate via Twitter, um, or if you want to use the uh, comment section in YouTube, um, feel free to comment as I'm talking, um, things that I'm saying, if you have, if that raises any questions, ask, uh, ask live, and I'll be, um, with some help, um, monitoring those questions, and then um, towards the end, we'll give an answer to, uh, to those questions. Um, so again, um, thanks for being a part of this very first, very exciting um, episode of Vox Veritas. Um, all right, so without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this lecture. So this is Practical Neuroscience. It's a course that I've taught for um, a, good number of, a good number of years. Um, and the idea is to understand a few basics about what the brain is and what it does um, to be able to figure out what the what the correct uh, what the what the way to um, how can we use this knowledge to uh, live better and to uh, to use the make the most of our brains? So we will we will begin. All right. So there are actually four things that I'd like to teach you. Um, so if you can um, just pay attention to to these uh, to these four things, um, I'm going to say them. Um, Myself, and then if you can, uh, we can. We'll go back and forth between the screen and myself. So, number one, the brain is extremely flexible. That's 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 point number one. Point number two, that's a, I just lied to you. I just I already messed it up. This is the problem with live broadcasting. You make mistakes. Point number one is, as you can see, the brain is totally awesome. Number two is the brain is extremely flexible. Number three, your mind makes it real. And number four, attention changes the brain. And so as we go through, we should be able to cover probably the first two of these points um, in the first uh, lecture. Um, and then in the next lecture, maybe get to points uh, three and four. It depends on uh, how uh, questions come and, and things like that. So um, we, will begin, we will begin with point number one. Um, actually, we're going to begin with about me. So... This is, a, this is a little bit about me. Um, I do work uh, in neuroscience. So one of the things, uh, this, is, this is a picture of me about to, about to go into an experiment. Uh, I was about, uh, that's a, an EEG, electroencephalograph cap on my head. Um, and over here on the left, you see that uh, this is my brain. Um, this is actually my brain. It's an MRI of my brain reconstructed into a three-dimensional um, model. And uh, here is uh, two targets that I'm going to uh, I'm going to line up to stimulate with a transcranial magnetic stimulator. So I do experiments shocking my own and other people's brains to find out to see what parts of brains do. Um, that's all interesting background, but not a whole lot of what we're talking about, at least not today. Um, all right, number one, number one. This is. This this one this is pretty self apparent. I mean, if you if you're here on a Sunday night listening to a neuroscience talk, then you probably already know this. But let me just geek out a little bit about the brain. Number one, the brain is totally awesome. Okay, I mean, there's a lot of things that are awesome, but this this is this is how it works. Okay, here's a here's a brain. You know, who else has a has a brain model on their desk? I do. But this this organ here that fits in your head is one of the coolest organs. You know, it's definitely the coolest organ we have. Why is that? 
Okay, first of all, um, what, what is a brain? Well, a brain is made up of more or less two different kinds of cell. The cells are the, the smallest parts, uh, sm smallest subunits of uh, your reproducing subunits of your body. Um, and so a cell, uh, there are neurons and support cells, sometimes called glia. And so the, uh, the first section, the first kind are neurons. You have 100 billion with a B neurons. And back in the olden days, there was the, the bad old days of, uh, you know, when, you, when your parents were learning things. Um, the, there was uh, there was some there was some question about um, do you have do you have new neurons um, and even 20 or 30 years ago the thought was once you get to about uh, once you get to my age for sure you're not getting any new neurons but what we've discovered is actually you have a lot of nerve growth neuron growth even as you get older um, and so there's uh, but and, and the other interesting thing is that there most of your most of the cells in your brain are actually support cells. Um, these are uh, these this this subpopulation of cells is called glia, and the glia actually make up. Uh, there's a trillion glia in your in your heads, and that's that's a lot. And again, in the olden days, the idea was, oh well, they're just they're just there for structural support, scaffolding or something. But as we're discovering, the glia make an important part of what your brain is and what your brain does, um, from shuttling nutrients to, um, to forming the uh, connections between cells to, to neurons, um, be, to possibly even restructuring which neurons connect to which neurons. Um, it's a really exciting um, new field is, is discovering that it's not just about the neurons. Maybe they've been hogging the spotlight for some of this time. So, and then number three, we have um, what are called synapses. So when you have um, one cell, one neuron connecting with another neuron, the place where they meet is is a synapse, and so there there's a lot of different connections in the brain, and a lot of neurons connect with other neurons, and so there are actually a zero point one five quadrillion with with a Q. I mean that billion with a B sounds good, quadrillion with a Q doesn't quite sound as cool, but in any case there are zero point one five quadrillion. A quadrillion is a thousand trillion. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of connections, um, and so. All of those connections make up the intricate wiring and machinery um, that is that is between your ears. All right. Um, now, what does a brain do? Um, well, it does a lot of things, and so I think the things that we're gonna um, there, there's there's some things that uh, I want to talk about in terms of your um, your uh, not just your your whole brain, but all of the sensory processing information um, from seeing uh, seeing a table to hearing a hearing a, a podcast this is all in, all of this uh, uses different parts of the brain to process um, and the, uh, one of the more exciting parts of the brain and certainly the, uh, I as a homo sapiens a uh, member of the species homo sapiens um, appreciate um, is that I have a prefrontal cortex this uh, this kind of front part here of the brain um, that allows me to do several things, and uh, so, for example, uh, m remember things like remember uh, what I'm supposed to be saying right now. Um, being able to do math—that's also part of what's called uh, working memory. Um, inhibition: I'm able to I'm able to hold a chocolate in my hand and not eat it if if that would have been, if that's a bad idea. Um, and then there's adaptation: being able to switch rapidly between different kinds of tasks. And um, you know, also we have uh, that the humans have uh, pretty big brains, uh, all things considered. Um, some people, um, this is a, an example of someone who has a smaller brain than others. This is uh, Homer uh, Homer Simpson. Um, now we're going to talk about the parts of the brain. So we talked about the smallest parts, the uh, the, the cells and the cell types. Um, now we're going to talk about the different uh, the different kinds of different uh, lobes of the brain. So um, one of the uh, so in this in this brain model here, um, we've got uh, we've got several different parts. So if you look at the brain from uh, from the side, you have this part here, which is the prefrontal cortex. This is involved in higher processing. Um, it's involved in um, in being able to to think and plan, like I just uh, like I just said. Um, Back here, the uh, this is the occipital, on the opposite side of the brain. Um, this is the occipital cortex. Um, this is this part of the brain processes vision. It processes the ability to uh, to to take in photons, process that, figure out what's actually going on. Um, the temporal lobe is involved with both hearing and 
memory. If you go on on the inner side, on the deep side, is, is where the, uh, the hippocampus memory part is. And then back here is the uh, parietal cortex. Parietal cortex is actually the part that is, uh, it, it's, it's a little more complicated than other, other parts. It's not straight ahead, oh, it does this or does that. But one of the things it does is helps with spatial awareness, um, and even spatial awareness of your own body. Um, so that's pretty cool. And this part on the bottom um, is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is that part of the brain that allows you to do totally awesome tricks on skateboards or snowboards or BMX bikes, like being able to like fine motor control things that and and do all that stuff that I totally can't do. Um, that is cerebellum. All right. So those are different parts of the brain. Now we're going to talk, um, and, and there's a new concept that's also emerging. Um, the, uh, the the brain the brain is kind of an orchestra. Um, in the olden days, they used to think that uh, you know the most important thing about the brain was the fact that this part lit up, and so it's uh, it's like saying, oh well, you know, over here we have the uh, we have the uh, the the strings. Um, maybe the the strings is the most important part of the brain, or the the strings lit up, or the horns the horns are going. Um, but but really, the more interesting thing that we're starting to look at now is that it's not just about this part or that part. It's really about how are they working together. Um, is a is a is a, uh, a part taken up started by one part of the orchestra taken up by another part, and then having that f that information flow between them and have that uh, that music play in a way that is uh, much more dynamic than just uh, than just having what part of the orchestra is is playing. Um, the uh, the map of where everybody sits is the least interesting part of going to the orchestra, though it is kind of neat once you figure it out. Um, all right, so that is a super short introduction to um, what the brain what the brain is. Now, point number two. Um, point number two is that the brain is extremely flexible. Now, a lot of the stuff I'm telling you is stuff that is 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 brand new. Thirty years ago, forty years ago, this is this is totally wouldn't even be talking about this. Um, so, all right. The brain is extremely flexible. What, is, what does that mean? How flexible is flexible? Okay, sure, we all know that we can learn new things. Sure, we can, we can go from, um, from being uh, children and learning, learning languages and all that. But, but really, really what, is, what does it mean to have a flexible brain? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. So um, I'm going to tell you about someone named Brandy Binder. Um, Brandy Binder um, was a, a girl who had an unfortunate condition called um, Rasmussen's encephalitis. Um, it's when one half of your brain has a giant problem and it um, continues to cause uh, seizures that um, which are, are sort of full body shaking. When you have se uh, a lot of seizures, you can't develop normally, you can't live a normal life. Um, and oftentimes, um, with other conditions, you can treat it with medications, but with Rasmussen's encephalitis, really, the, 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 the best treatment, the, the most uh, effective treatment, um, is something called a hemispherectomy. Um, now, for those of you who know your root languages, hemisphere means half. So a brain hemisphere would be this. Ectomy means to take out. So they took out half of Brandy Binder's brain. Um, so they actually went in there, opened up her, opened up her skull, and took out half of her brain. Now you think, oh my gosh, how could somebody live without half a brain? But the picture on the uh, on the left there is a picture of her immediately after surgery. Um, and what happened there? Well, she grew up to be a normal, well-functioning uh, woman. In fact, um, she she has a website. Um, you can Google her, and uh, this is where I, I heard about her story. Um, and uh, she's actually an artist, um, so she posts her art. Um, so children, when they're young enough, who have this procedure, you think, oh my gosh, it's got to be terribly debilitating. You have, you have half a brain. How could you live with half a brain? It turns out that especially children have incredibly flexible brains. And so all of the things that, um, that we think of as uh, being this part of the brain and that part of the brain only are oftentimes crossed over in children. And so by the time you grow up, um, you're not going to have a lot of, of deficits. You don't have a lot of problems when you get to be older. Um, really, the only things that sh uh, that uh, people who have this uh, this operation tend to have are uh, little um, problems with um, peripheral vision and problems with um, with uh, a little bit of um, fine motor. Um, but overall, not enough to 
not enough to uh, to to keep you from doing art. Um, so it's it's really pretty incredible. Um, now I'm also going to tell you about Kim Peak. Now if you look over um, on the uh, the top here, this is um this is a normal brain, um, and both sides are both sides are connected. Um, and you see the uh, the the white matter here. The corpus callosum is the part of the brain that connects the left and the right. With Kim Peak, he doesn't have it. He doesn't have a well structured corpus callosum. Now, normally we think, oh my gosh, this guy's got brain damage. Um, he's not going to be able to think. But actually, um, it gave, in some ways, it gave him an incredible ability for memory and um, and math. In fact, so much so that it became he became the inspiration for a movie called Rain Man, which is a classic um, that was even before. That even predates me, if that's even possible. Um, it's an intriguing movie about a um, about a person who had this incredible ability to remember things. Um, so Kim Peek was uh, was actually able to um, he read he was able to sight read he read uh, twelve thousand books uh, and he was able to memorize the Quran in ten minutes, not too shabby. Um, but in some other, in other ways, um, he was uh, he had extreme difficulties with social relationships. Um, that while he had some uh, some greater abilities in some areas, he had deficits in others. So, um, the next thing I want to tell you about, and a lot of this work, a lot of the flexibility of the brain was actually recently discovered. Um, and so, um, half a century ago, when they were um, they were trying to figure out. The different parts of the brain that um, when, when they were trying to figure out uh, in a person who had epi epilepsy that the, the had, had these seizures, what part of the brain do we need to cut out so that the person stops having seizures? And so the way you actually do this is you take this the, the you take part of the skull off, and while the person's awake, you shock different parts of the brain um, to try to identify where the uh, where the seizure focus is. While you do that, you get all this interesting information about what those parts of the brain do, um, and so we're actually able to uh, create a map of the different parts of the brain and so um, you see this is the uh, sensory cortex uh, this is a, a, a this is the different parts we discovered that different parts of the brain do different things and the more pro the more um, sensitive or the or the more uh, fine the movements are and the more fine the sensation is the more brain power it takes up so you see over here um, the uh, Lips and face and nose and eyes and fingers take up a huge amount of the this this uh, somatosensory strip, and over here the amount of uh, of brain that goes into moving your hand or moving your fingers um, is is a lot. It takes a lot of processing power to to uh, to really have these fine motor skills, um, and so uh, so being able to figure out um, where this was 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 a huge accomplishment. Um, but the uh, the interesting thing was okay now that we know that these things are are there how flexible are they once you're grown up and once you've set these things to where they're going to be um so here's the um here's a uh, they did a series of experiments um in uh in in actually uh, in primates um so they would uh they would do things like bind their fingers together or um or um play with the, uh, the the nerves like um stop information from coming back in one of the nerves and seeing seeing where the uh what part would would light up so we would uh, stimulate one part of the uh this check on the signals and as they uh, as they stimulate the finger read in the brain what's actually going on so they actually did this but then as they cut the nerve they would see oh my gosh the the uh, the parts of the brain that were neighboring would grow in to fill it up so instead of having five fingers now they have four fingers worth of brain um, and those four fingers now take up more processing space. Or if they would tie two fingers together. So if I were to tie two of your fingers together, and you only you always ever move those two fingers together, you would end up having four fingers and not five. Um, and the same thing on uh, on learning. If uh, th there's a uh, a task where they have the the uh, the monkeys reach in and like pick out their food pellets, and they would do this faster and faster and faster, but they got much better at pinching pinching their food and the part of the brain involved with using their their uh, thumb and uh, forefinger and, and um, index finger got better and better and better it got bigger it physically expanded so when you practice these things your brain actually changes this is absolutely a revolution in how we were thinking about how the um, how the brain works um, so um, so the the question is, um, what um, how does this how does this apply to uh, humans? This is this is really interesting um, 
this is really interesting work, but how does it apply to uh, to you and me? Um, so here's um, here's another experiment they did. They actually looked at uh, strings players, and when you play a stringed instrument, um, your left hand does a lot of fine finger movements, and your right hand has the large scale movements of moving the bow. Um, and what they did was they actually ex they um, they tested to see how much of the brain does a string player use. And so it, it turns out, compared to a normal person or compared to piano players, a string player had much more uh, much more finger response um, over here that controls the left hand than this side that controls the right hand. Of course, the the brain signals switch when they get down around here. Um, so you're actually um, as an adult able to change. You're able to actually change as an adult the part of the, the amount of brain power you have going to your fingers. So that's super cool. Okay, what's another super cool thing? Another super cool thing is uh, taxis. So if you were to start to learn how to drive a taxi, um, the part of your brain right here, the hippocampus, in fact, the the front side of the hippocampus, um, the part of your brain dedicated to trying to figure out um, where the where this street went and and keeping this map of uh, in the, the case of the study of London. Um, Keeping that in mind requires a actually bigger part of the part that, that controls for spatial memory. So, the the to become a taxi driver in London, you have to memorize all these vast number of streets and memorize this and memorize that. It's actually the hard, uh, said to be the hardest way to become a taxi. The hardest place to become a taxi driver in the whole world is in London. And then when they compared these guys to other professional drivers who don't have to memorize as much, they have different sizes. Wow. So when you when you are sitting memorizing that stuff for class, your brain is actually changing. That's pretty cool. Okay. So it is uh so we have um this is uh, an, uh, another uh example of uh, of growth. So this is um stroke. So sometimes um sometimes what happens to patients is uh when uh, blood stops going to a part of their brain, that part of the brain dies. And so, depending on where that is, they'll lose certain functions. So, if you, uh, for example, if you uh, have a, a, a stroke over here, you'll lose the ability to speak. The uh, part of the brain that controls speech is right around here. And so, if that goes out, you start having um, you start having what's called aphasia, and you're not able to speak as well. But what they found was the opposite side of the brain. So this is the part that was damaged, and if you go to the opposite side of the brain, it, it, you start to use a similar uh, a similar sided part of the brain for um, for processing um, processing speech. Um, after you go for a few months, you actually have this this side of the brain take over. The part of the brain that doesn't normally process speech learns how to process speech after practice. And it's not just in people who have serious um, uh, injuries. This is actually a um, th th this is another example of uh, plasticity. This is a a, a, a brain port device where you put this little pad on your tongue and you could actually project an image onto this this uh, this device and you hold it on your mouth and it actually will allow you to see with your tongue your your brain is able to figure out and say hey information is information i can process it coming from my eyes i can process it coming from my tongue it doesn't matter i am able to be adaptive enough to actually make that work how awesome is that seeing with your tongue okay we've got we've got uh, another example here if I were to blindfold you and make you read Braille, within 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 five days, five days of being blindfolded, you actually take the part of your brain that is processing visual information, and as you can see in this image here, you start to process that part of that in, that information, in tactile information, thing, information that would normally be processed by your fingers. Um, and the parts of your brain associated with that start being processed in your visual cortex. Your visual cortex says, hey, I'm not doing anything. Hey, I can help out with some of your work if you want, and actually increases the processing power and your ability to learn. So you're able to be so incredibly dynamic with how you do things. Um, your brain is able to, to adapt and change and, and develop. It's, it's, an inc it's incredible um, what we're learning about how flexible the brain is. Um, so. I think um, we're gonna we're actually going to um, to pause here um, for for questions. Um, we didn't quite finish all of number two, but I think uh, I think that we're going to um, pick it up here next week. So um, if you guys now can uh, submit questions, we will 
uh, go ahead and start to answer um, answer some of those questions that you sent in, and uh, and go from there. So um, first question. Um, the first question is from about um, Brandy Binder. Um, okay, so the question is um, about being able to live with um, with half a brain. Um, it's a very good question. Can I live with that? What would happen if you took out half of my brain? First of all, please, please don't take out half my brain. I would not appreciate it if you took out half my brain. Um, the thing is, while the brain is extremely flexible, it's more flexible, it's, it's, it's crazily flexible when you're a child, and it becomes less and less flexible when you get older. Now, does that mean that you're, it's not flexible when you become a, a total grown-up? No. Um, that means that it's... We used to think that it was all or nothing. Now we think that you have a lot of flexibilities in, uh, as a grown-up, and just huge amounts of flexibility when you're a child. Um, so... Uh, if you were to take out half of my brain, um, I would lose all kinds of function because it's um, I wouldn't be able to learn how to completely adapt. Um, as I showed you with um, these people who had stroke, when you have a, a stroke is, is basically damaging um, half of or, or usually on the order of a quarter or an eighth of your brain um, doesn't have uh, is is having having problems and you have really serious deficits from stroke. Um, so. Old people aren't as flexible with uh, with this, but the answer to the question is literally yes. You can live with half a brain, so that's pretty that's pretty awesome. Um, half a brain is and and th there's also other cases of people who were born with um, lacking a large amount of, of um, lacking a large amount of, of brain matter, and so people who will go in for a, uh, some sort of a brain scan for other reasons. Um, and the, the doctors will find and say, oh my gosh, how are you alive? You don't, you don't have much brain. Um, but the, for whatever reason in birth um, or in their birth history, um, they didn't have brain and they were able to adapt to whatever it was that, um, what, however much brain they were born with. Um, okay, second question. Um, I don't get how you can see with your tongue. Can I explain that more? Um, yeah, so the, the question about um, Sight is, is really interesting. So when we say sight, what are we what are we talking about? We're talking about trying to understand the the world that is made apparent by photons bouncing off of them. So um, what we're able to we're able to sort of see this 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 uh, your, the photons are coming out of your monitor into your eyeballs, um, and you're able to sort of make out what I'm doing. You're able to see that I'm holding up two fingers because. Photons are coming out of that light beam, bouncing off of that wall, hitting this finger, and then going into my camera and then out into your eyes. If instead of hitting your eyeball, it hit a camera, and then that camera, instead of signing, sending the signal to your visual cortex, sent the information to your somatosensory cortex, your brain is still able to figure out the meaning of it. Your brain is still able to figure out spatially where things are. Um, but the question of, um, you know, is it, is it really sight? Well, that's a good question. Um, one could also ask, is it really, um, is it really sight to, um, is, it, is this person really feeling or seeing the braille? The part of the brain that processes vision normally is actually doing the feeling now. So it really, it, it, uh, it speaks to the flexibility of all of these different parts of the brain. Okay, um, third question. What happens when you shock your brain? Um, that's a that's a really good question. I um I might actually be able to have a uh, a picture for that. Um, so the what what happens when you shock your brain is it uh, it it makes the the neurons that are um, underneath the spot that's being shocked fire. So Normally, if I wanted to move my thumb, the neurons that are in charge of my thumb, which are right around here, they would they would say move thumb, and the thumb the thumb would move. If instead of having them say move, if I had a coil or a, 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 a something to shock it and say you know send the the move signal, you'd get the movement without them. Um, but it all depends on where you stimulate. Um, and so that's actually that's it's an excellent question. Um, that's in fact the, <laughs> that's in fact uh, the answer to that question is my whole research career. <laughs> so I'm um, 
I'm not quite sure um, the full answer, but hope to get back to you in a decade or 10 um, to give you the answer to what happens when you stimulate your brain. All right, everybody. Um, that does it for um, that does it for this week's edition of Vox and Veritas. Um, so next week we're going to do uh, practical neuroscience part two, and we're going to uh, try to have a chance uh, for for chat. Uh, we are working on the technical difficulties here. Um, so if you have other ideas, suggestions, questions, technologies, things that you'd like to know about, please feel free to tweet. Please feel free to comment or email. Um, let me put up the information um, of where to uh, to send that information to. But um, please uh, please feel free to engage. Um, and uh, I I think that it's uh, super exciting to have have you all online and uh, active. Um, again, tell your friends. Uh, watch this if you have any questions. Uh, watch this again. Um, this will be recorded. Um, so again, here's the email address um, box n veritas at gmail or um, at vox and veritas um, on twitter so uh, if you um, we're going to be back um, 830 um, 828 p.m. every sunday um, so please uh, join us again for vox and veritas live for some more practical neuroscience all right everybody bye <laughs>